174. Moral Disarmament. Calcedon Report, number 31, March 1st, 1968. In our last newsletter, our subject was anarchistic love as a revolutionary concept and an erosive force. To continue our analysis, it must be pointed out next that the total impact and purpose of all such thinking is moral disarmament. Moral disarmament always precedes the economic, political and military disarmament and dismemberment of a people. Disarmament begins first in the mind and soul of man, and it proceeds then to affect his every activity. The forces of moral disarmament have always been present in history, but in recent years they have become progressively more vocal. The nature of their attack, if anyone had missed it previously, became obvious in 1928 when Ernest Sutherland Bates published his book, The Friend of Jesus. In many respects, Judas came out as Jesus' best friend. In fact, one could say Judas came out better than Jesus at Bates's hands. But the book attracted only minor notice. Moral disarmament had already reached the point where Bates's book was not startling. Evil was now getting more sympathy than good. A betrayer had become a tragic and noble figure, and treason was thus somehow a higher loyalty. Instead of a clear-cut stand by people for truth and against error, for God against Satan, for right against wrong, and for law against crime, there was now a growing and serious moral confusion. The next decade saw gangsters extensively glorified in motion pictures, and the films made money simply because they met a growing popular demand. Sympathy was now with the rebel, the criminal, and the pervert. Captain Bly, who was actually a man of calibre, became a symbol of evil, and the degenerate lot of mutineers in the bounty became popular heroes. Moral disarmament makes us sympathetic with evil in order to make us hostile to good. If we are made to feel for Judas, to that extent we are separated from Christ. The end result is that we are asked to be friendly with hell itself, to approve of coexistence with everything evil, religious, moral, political and economic. The next step is to call the good evil. Thus, an Episcopal scholar, Marshall W. Fishwick, in Faust Revisited, Some Thoughts on Satan, 1963, sends Christian conservatives readily to hell. Thus, Fishwick writes on one man. Descended from a good family, this public-spirited fellow made a good thing out of cleanliness. He ran for public office on a ticket of clean government, clean elections and clean towels in City Hall. Campaigning in immaculately white colours, he won easily and self-righteously crowed proudly from the church steeples. He was very busy until the day he died. There were so many meetings of the Children's Welfare Bureau that he neglected his own children, one of whom ran off with the trombonist in a jazz combo. He was too clean to allow his city to go into debt, so it built no new schools. He also refused to take federal funds to provide free lunches, since he thought that was dirty politics. He erred in the name of high principles. He went to hell. Pages 39 and 40 Fishwick also declares, There is something satanic about suburbia. Page 80 And he hopes that someone will burst our ideas of good and evil all to hell and free theology. Page 128 Notice Fishwick's association of ideas. Clean government, clean elections, clean towels and clean collars are all somehow marks of self-righteousness and evil. They lead to a neglect of one's own children. If you do not go into debt, you are against progress, quote, new schools, end quote, and are a Pharisee. Taking federal funds is good, refusing them is bad. Quote, high principles, end quote, will send you to hell. After a couple of generations and more of such teaching and preaching, is it any wonder that the people are morally disarmed? In the name of the modernist, quote, Christ, end quote, 
They are now for evil and against good. In the name of Americanism, they tolerate communists and oppose anti-communists. In the name of morality, they invite perverts into their fellowship and exclude Christians because they refuse to tolerate evil. Pastor Richard Wurmbrandt has written that many Western Christian church leaders defended their associations with communist leaders, saying, As Christians, we have to be friendly with everybody you know, even the communists. Why then are they not friendly to those who had suffered? Why did they not ask one word about the priests and pastors who had died in prison or under torture? Or leave a little money for the families that remained? These church leaders were either morally disarmed or were busy disarming the churches morally. Their sympathy is with evil, not good, with Antichrist, not Christ. Of course, these churchmen assure us that their hearts are full of love for everyone and they are burning with a passion to, quote, save, end quote, mankind. A very prominent and able English congregational theologian, John S. Weil, in Victor and Victim, 1960, assures us that the goal of the universe is the end of all estrangement, the fullness of reconciliation in Christ. And this means that Satan himself is finally saved. Page 41. Now, if Satan himself is going to be saved and spend eternity with us, why should we, and how can we, be too hostile to him now? If Stalin and Kosygin are going to be our brothers in heaven, can we deny them love and brotherhood now? If coexistence is our destiny in heaven, why not begin practising it now? Weil said, The goal of the universe is the end of all estrangements. This means the end of all discrimination and division. But the biblical doctrine of heaven and hell is a denial of coexistence in time and eternity. It means that the goal of the universe is actually the final estrangement of good and evil, of the saints and the sinners. It means that a separation in terms of the righteousness of God in Christ is basic to the historical process. Take away this doctrine and you deny that there is an ultimate distinction between good and evil. Coexistence then becomes a religious and political necessity. Emery Storrs once said, When hell drops out of religion, justice drops out of politics. Cited by Harry Buess, The Doctrine of Eternal Punishment, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Presbyterian and Reformed Publishing Company, 1957, Page 122. The coexistence preachers tell us that hell is a horrible doctrine. But is there any hell equal to the horror of coexistence between God and Satan, good and evil, Christ and Antichrist? Religious and political coexistence has created more misery and horror than we can begin to imagine. Justice and hell bring law, order and sanity to life. But moral disarmament wants to destroy all the God-given distinctions. Its hope is that problems disappear if we say they are non-existent. Its moral disarmament is a necessary step for a surrender to evil. Some of the disarmers talk about moral rearmaments. But is it moral rearmament to blur the distinctions between religions, to work for the unity of things which are by nature contrary, and to assume that God will ratify man's open contempt for his call to separateness? Any honest survey of the world scene indicates that we have been morally disarmed. The churches, on the whole, are in the enemy's camp, actively engaged in moral disarmaments. The Bible is neither believed nor taught and an alien religion is preached from the pulpits. We are also politically disarmed. We treat our enemies as friends, and our friends as enemies. We are soft on communism and hard on Christianity, orthodox Christianity. The unpopular man is he who demands a moral stand in any area, in religion, politics, economics, education, or anywhere else. Moral disarmament is the prelude to collapse and ruin, to captivity and slavery. 
The reason we are not already enslaved is simply that our enemy is still weaker than we are, and we still have a saving remnant. To counteract the prevailing moral disarmament, more than pietism is needed. Christian maturity, Christian growth is necessary. Reconstruction requires, first of all, sound doctrine, biblical faith, and second, the development of Christian thinking in every area, in economics, politics, education, science, and all things else. The reign of terror in the French Revolution was directed, quite openly, against three groups. First, political counter-revolutionaries were to be liquidated. Second, the economic aspect, all who, quote, hoarded, end quote, food or money to protect themselves, were marked for execution. Third, organised, faithful Christians were marked for beheading on the guillotine also. The last target, Christianity, was the central one, the nerve of hostility to revolution. By November 1793, the Marquis de Sade and other revolutionists were ready to propose a new religion of reason, humanism. The goal was moral disarmament. The purpose was to create a humanistic paradise on earth. The result was hell on earth. As a loyal biographer of Sade admits, reason had been exalted to the status of a god and committees, Assemblies and communes deliberated on concepts of law, order and justice, but it was Madame Guillotine who ruled, without reason, without justice. She served all men with equal candour as they knelt at her feet and blessed them with the benediction of her weighted blade. Norman Gear, The Divine Demon, a portrait of the Marquis de Sade, page 131. The goal of the revolution of moral disarmaments then was liberty, fraternity and equality. Liberty from God, fraternity in sin, equality of all moral, economic and religious distinctions. But the end was liberty from life, fraternity in death and equality in hell. This is always the conclusion of moral disarmaments. Let us heed St. Paul's words. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armour of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armour of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and, having done all, to stand. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 13.